Thank you, Lawrence, and hi, everyone. So my name is Francesco, and I'm the business development manager covering games for Western Europe. <laughs> Great start. So today, I'm really excited to talk to you about a research that we did at Google Play on how to use affinity learnings to better understand your players. But first of all, let's start by what do we mean by affinity? Well, affinity is defined as a natural attraction to something else, which, if you think about it, in the gaming world means whether by knowing that a person or a group of users uh, enjoy particularly playing a particular category of games, let's say match three games, whether they are more or less likely also to enjoy playing other genres that might have high affinity with the match three category. That could be idol games, puzzle and brain games, or maybe casino games. And you may ask now, why is it so important to know? Well, because knowing what happens to your users also outside of your portfo portfolio, outside of your games, can really help you to create better user profiles and therefore make the right decisions when it comes to uh, you know, developing new features uh, within your existing games. And maybe you want to better leverage your players learning from other genres that have high affinity to your players and maybe you know, engage or monetize your gamers better. Or also when it comes to portfolio decisions, when you want to launch new games, either in the, in the existing genres where you're already present or potentially new genres. So today we have a lot of interesting insights to share with you. But I wanted to start by talking to you about two companies that, in my opinion, did an amazing job at trying to better understand their players with research and affinity insights. The first one is Playrix. All of you know very well Playrix, one of the most successful developers in the world, uh, very active in the match three category. So what Playrix did that I found extremely interesting well, they in invested a lot in extensive research to better understand their player behavior. And what they did, they started right away from Gardenscapes, one of their biggest games. And what they did, they you know, started testing, adding elements of storyline, quests, and narrative to their game. And what they actually found out is that the vast majority of their players were actually loving these parts of the games and only a very few percentage of their gamers were playing purely the core match three mechanics. And what was very interesting to see is that they actually leveraged these type of insights to then, you know, during the, um, when they work on, the, on their other very famous game, Homescapes, and actually they leveraged these uh, insights that they got from Gardenscapes, and so they started adding this element of quest and storyline also to Homescapes, and that allowed them to reach amazing retention and engagement numbers right from the day one after home Homescapes launched, even higher than in Gardenscapes, which was really impressive. The second company I want to talk to you about is Game Basics. Game Basics is based here in the Netherlands, and they are a developer that is extremely innovative. So what Game Basics did, they actually uh, talked to their players when it came to you know, making their portfolio decisions and the strategic decisions. And what they did, they actually kicked off what they called player profiling surveys, where they pretty much asked their community what they wanted them to build next, both in terms of new features within their existing game, Online Soccer Manager, but also in terms of new games that their players wanted to play. And what came back from it were extremely interesting insights. First of all, they got a lot of insights on how to improve online soccer manager with features like the Champions League that they launched or even with better integration with YouTube influencer within their games. But then the other thing that I found extremely interesting is that they saw a very high affinity between their sports gamers and this strategy category. And so they actually decided to you know, build the game out of this. And so they're actually now building what they call Dynasty Duels, which is currently in soft launch, a very exciting strategy game, and is coming soon to the platform. So we learned about this, uh, how these two companies did an amazing job at better understanding their players with research and affinity data. But I also know that doing these things is extremely expensive and time consuming. And so maybe not all the developers here have the resources to invest so much in research. 
And so we at Google, we thought we could really help you, giving you some insights using our platform data. And so we developed a methodology, you know, analyzing courts of users playing particular games in particular genres, in this case, MMORPG, for instance, and then seeing what else do they do on the platform. For instance, do they have high affinity with other categories like sports games, MOBA, Invest Express, and so on? And how do these users change their engagement and spend behavior when they go from one genre to another? And that is exactly what we're going to share with you today. So we divided the insights in two main buckets, the insights about the gamers, and then the insights on how to use affinity and research to make better portfolio decisions. But let's start with the insights about your gamers, your audience. So on this one, we had, you know, while doing this data analysis research, we had so many things that we wanted to share with you. And it was extremely hard to package it in a talk of 20 minutes or so. So we decided to focus on the main learnings that we got here. But then you have to keep an eye on the uh, Medium post uh, channel from Google Play, because we're very likely in the next few months uh, release more data about more genres. When it comes to the gamers and to this talk, I wanted to focus on one very important insight that I got. And this is how affinity analysis can help you not only to better understand your players, but potentially to even debunk myths about them. And to do so, I wanted to focus on uh, a particular set of gamers that, in my opinion, are very often misunderstood in the gaming community. And these are the arcade and hypercasual gamers. So by talking to developers, I hear very often think, uh, things like, you know, arcade and hypercasual gamers only play arcade and hypercasual type of titles, characterized by low APK, very easy controls, very easy tutorials, and so on. I also hear things like arcade and hypercasual users mainly uh, you know, watch ads in terms of monetization and therefore don't really spend on in-app purchases. And for all this reason, I hear developers saying that these type of users are not the right target audience for them. But I want to show you how using affinity and platform data, we could show that some of these things are not like they look like. First of all, it's actually quite wrong to call them only arcade and hypercasual gamers, because the vast majority of them, 95% of them, play also games outside of the arcade and hypercasual category. And you may ask whether this 95% is high or low. Well, when you compare it to other categories, that is one of the highest that you see in the industry. So 95% of arcade and hypercasual gamers will play also games from other categories. But if you take the courts of users from sports games, for instance, well, only 83% of them will play games outside of the sport category. And these stats go down, goes down even more when it comes to shooter category and when it comes to match three, where only 75% of the match three players will play other games outside of the match three category. And so after seeing this data, I was asking myself, you know, it's pretty clear that arcade and hypercasual users really like to test other stuff outside of arcade and hypercasual category. But what are these categories that they enjoy so much playing? And so what we did, we plotted the engagement data of arcade and hypercasual users to see what else do they do outside of that category. And that's what it looks like. But let me take a couple of minutes to explain you how to read this graph. So on the x-axis, you see pretty much a proxy of the affinity by arcade and hypercasual users to other genres. So the more a bubble is on the right-hand side, the, more, the higher the affinity will be for arcade and hypercasual gamers. The y-axis instead is a proxy of the session length. So you can see how potentially these type of gamers, when they go from one genre to another, they're very open to change their engagement behavior. So if you think about this graph, if arcade and hypercasual gamers were playing only arcade and hypercasual titles, then you would not see any bubble in this chart. We learned before that actually these users are extremely open to try other games in other categories. And so that's what their engagement looks like. So a few call-outs here. The first one is that 
runner is actually the category that has the highest affinity to arcade and hypercasual gamers. And that makes total sense because runner can also be characterized as a hypercasual category, you know, low APK size, uh, pretty easy controls, and so on and so forth. But then what's a little bit more a surprise to see how strong is the, engage, the, the affinity also to another category, shooter, which is also very far on the right hand side. Because shooter is, you can argue that it's pretty, you know, not that similar to arcade and hypercasual, but still these users love to play shooter games. And the other interesting insights that I got from this slide is to see how the users are very open to change their engagement behavior based on the design of the type of games that they play. So you can see a very high pool of genres like Runner or Invest Express, Racing, and Eden Object that have pretty low session length. But then when these users, these arcade and hypercasual users, go to other genres like MMORPG or Shooter, well, their session length goes up by up to 20x, which was a very interesting insight for me. So as a, as a result of that, I was thinking, is it also true for spend data? Is it also true that arcade and hypercasual gamers, although they might not spend much on in-app purchases in these type of games, when they go to other categories that they monetize much better through in-app purchases, they also change their spend behavior? So what I did, I pretty much plotted the same type of data, keeping the x-axis as a proxy of the engagement by the amount of players playing other genres. But then on the y-axis, instead of uh, saying a proxy of their session length, I decided to plot the buyer percentage. And that's for in app purchases only. And that's how it looks like. So, again, if arcade and hyper casual gamers were only you know, watching ads and not spending much on in app purchases, then you would see all this bubble down. But you can see that there are a lot of other genres that are actually much higher up. And so, you can see how the buyer percentage for arcade and hyper casual gamers, looking at in app purchases only, it changes completely when they play Runner or Eden Object, Puzzle uh, and Brain Games or Racing. Well, their in a purchase uh, behavior, their buyer percentage is particularly low. But then when they go to more uh, strategy games or like shooter games, well, they're very open to spending in a purchases. You can see that buyer percentage can, can be as high as 20x higher than with arcade and hyper casual category. So to me, it was very interesting to see how you know, these type of gamers are not only very open to play other type of categories, but are also very open to change their engagement and spend behavior when they go from one genre to another. But that was only part of the story, because you know, there are so many more insights that we can also use to make better decisions when it comes to portfolio strategy. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about right now. So, we divided the insights about how to use affinity to shape your portfolio strategy on two main categories. If you want to launch new games in the same genre, or if you want to expand to new genres. So I will cover the first part, and then I will let Guy come up on stage and talk to you about the plurium, um, the plurium uh, effect of going from one genre to another extremely successfully. So when it comes to launch new games in the same genre, the number one worry that all the developers have is about cannibalization. So what you definitely don't want to do is to have you know, one game in a particular genre, let's call it game A, and then launch another game, game B, in the same genre, and then see all your users going from game A to game B. And so we thought, how can we use platform data to show whether some genres are more likely than others to have high risk of cannibalization? So what we did, we took cohorts of core users, meaning the users that spend at least a third of their gaming time in one particular genre, and we saw how many of them play one game in the genre, two games, or three or more games. And that's how it looks like. So as you can see from this slide, you can see that MMORPG core gamers, meaning the ones who play at least a third of their gaming time in MMORPG alone, well, 87% of them play only one game in the MMORPG category. And only 3% of them are open to experiment three or more games in the MMORPG category. 
And that's pretty much the same story also for puzzle RPG, strategy, and MOBA. And that makes total sense because these are uh, genres where, you know, the user has to invest a lot of time and effort and potentially money to upgrade their characters to progress. And so the barrier to switch from one game to another is extremely high. But what happens if we look at more casual genres? Well, we can see that the percentage of users playing three or more games in the genre goes up significantly. Up to 20% of Invest and Express gamers will play three or more titles in the category. And that, again, makes kind of sense because in these idle games, you know, it's very popular to log in into one of them, do some actions, then log out and go to the next one. But there are two categories that, in this special ranking, are even higher. They were a little bit of a surprise to me. Those two are sports and racing. So racing gamers, for instance, up to 28% of them will be you know, very open to play three or more games in the racing category. And that's very similar for sports. That was a little bit of a surprise to me. But then I thought about developers like Miniclip and EA that did an amazing job at having a very successful multi-title portfolio strategy, trying to minimize the risk of cannibalization between their games. So I hope that this uh, type of insights was useful for you when it comes to launch new games in the same genre where you're already present in. But now I want to invite on stage Guy to talk about his experience at Plarium uh, to go successfully with new titles from one genre to another. Please welcome Guy with a big round of applause. Thank you. Right. So, thank you, Francesco. Is it? Okay. Uh, so, as Francesco mentioned, I'm Guy. I work at a game studio called Plarium. And throughout the years, we've been mostly known for making uh, strategy MMO games, where you basically build your base, amass your troops, and go and attack other players, join clans, join alliances, and play together. However, in recent years, we started expanding into new genres. And I'm basically going to walk you through some of the insights uh, and on, on all the things that we did. But before that, I would like to take a oh, step back and ask you, how do we define genres, right? Uh, traditionally, uh, you have a top-down definition of genres. Uh, you have racing games, you have action games, you have role-playing games, simulation games. And from that, you divide them into subcategories or subgenres uh, until you reach a point where you start you know, being confused. Is my racing simulator game a racing game or a simulation game? Um, so this can cause problems sometimes when you try to find out exactly where you are in the market. Uh, instead, what we decided to do is to do a bottoms up uh, genre classification. Right now, actually, in Google Play, for example, you can look at different tags for your games, which are basically a collection of mechanics. And your game can have this mechanic or that mechanic, and eventually from that you can derive exactly what genre your game is in, or maybe multiple genres. Uh, so at Plarium, what we did is started with basically a thorough research of over 500 uh, games in the Play Store, uh, the most successful ones. And we tried to build everything bottoms up. We tried to look at every game, what kind of mechanics that game implements. And from that, we managed to categorize them into, well, three arch genres or arch categories. Uh, the first one is casual, where it's basically, basically games where you can commit time, but you don't have to. Then you have action and arcade games, where you mostly have to commit if you want to play successfully, you have to invest in becoming a more skillful player, uh, um, sharpen your reflexes. And then other games, such as simulation, strategy, and RPG, where uh, to be more skillful, you have to invest time in more complex systems that the game offers you. Uh, so we managed to categorize that, and we know where we are. We know that we make base management strategy games. And from that, it was easier for us to see what's closer to the kind of games that we make, what's further away. Um, so when, you, when you're looking at different kinds of genres, asking yourself where I should be expanding to, it's really nice to think about market size. 
And Venn, Venn diagrams, uh, you can see them right here. They're an skill, extremely useful tool. I love them, but sometimes people misread them. For example, when you're making a shooter game that is also a puzzle game, you're telling yourself, hmm, I'm going to tap the market both for people who love shooters and people who love puzzle games, which is an interesting approach. However, that's not actually how it works. What you actually get is shooter, people who like shooter games, some of them hate puzzle games, the others do not, and vice versa. There are some people who play puzzle games and hate shooter games, and those would obviously not play your puzzle shooter game. So the actual audience is much smaller than what you initially expected, and the key question is exactly how small it is. Uh, it's not necessarily bigger than tapping into just one genre, and that's why you need to look for things that are closer to what you're already making if you're trying to expand. Uh, so that's what we did. We basically asked ourselves, OK, we've been making strategy MMO games for almost a decade. Uh, what do we do very well within that genre? So we looked at individual and social elements. Um, individual elements include uh, narrative, uh, missions, and collectibles. And social, for social, we included leagues, clubs, and clans, uh, which were all things that we did very well within our games already. Uh, so we took, we took these insights, we understood, okay, that's where we are. We're trying to expand into new games, in new genres. Uh, the first example is actually our most recent title, Raid Shadow Legends, which has been extremely successful uh, and is now our top game. Um, it's a collection RPG. It's not the first collection RPG. There have been some in the market, mostly targeting uh, Asian uh, crowd. Uh, however, what we did differently is took our learnings from strategy games and implemented a lot of mechanics that uh, give you more social play. Things like participating in uh, clans, uh, other things such as rating different heroes in the game and then letting other players see how you rated them, and obviously things like social chat. Uh, so all of these things give you more cooperative play and I think it's one of the reasons why Raid became such a successful game uh, within the genre. Now, the same principles don't apply to all genres, which is why another game that we did called Lost Island Blast Adventure, uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't apply clan mechanics and stuff like that. You don't you know, gang up with other clans and other players in these casual games. However, we still understood that we're doing something good in strategy games, which is basically giving you a very nice narrative to go through the game when you play solo. And that's what we did with Lost Island. We decided, OK, this is a casual game, but you don't have to just go through the levels. Let's give players an interesting narrative that evolves over time. We still deliver new chapters, new story elements every once in a while over the course of the game. And then on top of the a traditional match or blast uh, gameplay, gameplay loop, you're getting an interesting story that players want to participate in and want to see how it progresses. They can collect items, they can uh, decorate things in the overworld, and it's basically giving them another incentive that most other traditional uh, match games do not. Um, so these have been two examples. Um, I hope that they, uh, they were interesting for you to understand how, how we did what we did. And I'd like to bring uh, Francesco back to recap everything. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Guy, for these amazing insights. Um, so to recap what we learned today, first of all, we learned how affinity analysis can help you understanding your user behavior and potentially debunk myths about your audience. So I really challenge all of you to look beyond what you see in your data because user profile might be much more than what you see in your titles only. Also, we learn how you know, users might be ready to uh, change their engagement behavior and their spend behavior depending on the game mechanics. So really try to learn about other genres that may monetize and engage better your players. And then we went into another set of learnings about how affinity analysis can help you to shape your portfolio strategy. We looked at when you expand to new games with the same genre, then you have to be aware of potential cannibalization, especially in hardcore genres. 
And then we learn uh, very interesting insights about Guy on how to successfully expand to new genres and leverage your existing um, learnings from other genres to innovate in the new ones. So I really hope you enjoyed the presentation. And we're going to be around if you have any questions. Thank you. <laughs>